One of the strangest frauds I've ever seen involved a tax commissioner stealing about $1.5 million from a small county in Georgia. Now, this happened some 30 years ago, early in my career, and when we found that this young lady was stealing money, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it because I knew the lady, and I found her to be a winsome, polite, nice person. And so this was my first taste of running into somebody that I liked that was stealing money. And it was a lesson I needed to learn early in my career, and I'm glad I did. Through the years, I've run into this same dynamic where you see professional-looking, nice, wonderful people stealing money, and you scratch your head and think, is this real? But it happens. And so in this presentation, we're going to look at the dark side of the moon. Now, as I just said in, in the example with the tax commissioner, we need to learn as auditors to ignore personality, to ignore how somebody looks, and, and to consider whether or not fraud could occur. And we look at internal controls, we look at audit evidence to see whether or not theft is occurring, and we need to do this regardless of who the people are that we are auditing, regardless of what we think we know about the person's character, we need to consider that a lot of people have a dark side of the moon. So let's start with the question, who is stealing? Now, quite often we don't know, but I'm going to ask another question here. Is the fraud occurring in your government at this moment, or maybe your business or nonprofit? And I will say to you, in most places, fraud is occurring. And you may say, but Charles, you've never been to my business. You've never been to my government or my nonprofit. How do you know that? <laughs> well, I know it from over 30 years of being an auditor and running into fraud time and time again. Now, sometimes the theft is not significant. Sometimes it's small. Sometimes it's very large. But I will say to you, in most entities, some theft is occurring. Mark Twain had a quote that, that led to my title to this presentation, and it's this, Everyone is a moon and has a dark side which he never shows to anybody. So if that's true, the people in businesses or nonprofits or governments that sometimes these people will do things that they hide from everybody else. And one of those things is stealing. So how do you know who is stealing? I mean, as you think about your place of business, how do you know who is stealing there? Would it be somebody that looks like this lady? How about this gentleman? Would either of these steal? How about this guy? If you look real closely, you'll see that he has thief written all over his face. Do you see it? Look real close. You see it there? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> so I'm playing with you. But sometimes you can look at people's body language and tell that things are amiss. So what does a typical fraudster look like? Well, he looks like this guy. Yeah, that's me. And so why would I say that I look like a typical fraudster? Well, I'm educated. I'm a male, usually about... 73% of the time, males are the ones that commit theft. And then 
I'm also, I, I'm experienced. In other words, I've been on the job for a long time. So people that still are quite often educated males that have, ha, that have tenure, they've been in the position for a while. So we look at this Association of Certified Fraud Exam, Examiners graphic, and we see that 73% of frauds were committed by men. Now, that's a real high percent, and I've often wondered, why is it that men still more often than the ladies do? But apparently we do. And when we still, notice that we still a larger amount. So men, when they steal, the median loss is 142000 For the ladies, it's 45000 So I guess ladies are kinder and gentler when they steal. We see that 64% of the time, people that are stealing in their place of work uh, and they have an education that the median loss is $195,000. For somebody without a college degree, it's $100,000. But in 64% of the cases, the fraudsters, the people stealing, had a college education. Now, you may have thought previously, well, I would think it would be somebody without an education. But think about it. People with a college education, they move up the ladder. They have more power. And when they have more power and position, they have greater ability to steal. Now, that ability deals with one of the three parts of the fraud triangle, and those three parts are rationalization, opportunity, and incentive. The, the ability to steal has to do with opportunity. So as somebody moves up uh, in the organization, they have more power, they can do more things than... They have opportunity to steal. People that are lower in the organization, they may not even have the ability to steal if they wanted to. So it makes sense that somebody with a college education is going to move up, have more power, and have a greater ability to steal. And consequently, they have the opportunity to steal. So... In, in most thefts, you've got rationalization, which is that first point of the fraud triangle, opportunity, and incentive. So first, they have to have the opportunity. If they have the opportunity, do they have an incentive to steal? Is there a reason, usually something privately going on in their personal life that would incentivize the theft and then if they steal, are they able to rationalize why they did it? Those three things, when they come together, uh, lead to uh, fraud. One more statistic here. Only 4% of perpetrators had a prior fraud conviction. So... Quite often, the person that's stealing money is not the person you think would steal money. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and acts like a duck, it's a duck, right? Well, not necessarily. You would think when you look at certain people, they have authority they are well-known, they're well-liked, they're professional, and you would think they would never steal. So sometimes people have things going on in their personal lives that we're not aware of that leads to the theft. And it can be things such as a gambling habit. Maybe uh, your friend at work is 
flying out to Vegas from time to time or going down to Biloxi or even just going on the internet and gambling and they have these losses and they have a need for more money and so they have this compelling unshareable need they're not telling everybody that they're gambling and losing a lot of money it's just happening sometimes uh, we see people with uh, drug problems I ran into this in a particular fraud that I was investigating and the person that was stealing money was stealing money to handle or provide for a cocaine habit. So again, another example of why people might steal, but on, you know, the day-to-day work that you and I do, we're sitting right next to these people and sometimes We have no idea what's going on in their private life. Also, keeping up with the Joneses. And this incentive is the one that happens more than any other factor. So if you look at the uh, Association of Certified Fraud Examiner surveys, you're going to see that keeping up with the Joneses that it's the number one reason that people steal. People just want to look more successful than they really are. They want to have things that they can't afford, and because they do, they're willing to take advantage of their job positions and steal money. And then the last factor I'm going to point out here with the compelling unshareable needs, is that of financial pressure. You know, I've had two kids in college at the same time. I know what it feels like when you've got this financial burden and you're wondering, how in the world am I going to pay for all of this? And when you feel that way, you can sometimes compromise. So in this slide, we see statistics from the ACFE behavioral red flags and the number one red flag is living beyond their means. The second one is financial difficulties. The third, unusually close relationships with vendors. So in this presentation, I'm merely trying to highlight the fact that people that you would never think would steal, they sometimes do. So if you're an an auditor, whether you're an external auditor or an internal auditor, you need to disregard the personality of the people that you're auditing, disregard their positions, their power, uh, disregard whether you like them, and exercise the professional skepticism that we're called to have. So without professional skepticism, we might look at those people and go, oh, they would never steal. And then we're not performing the jobs that we need to perform. So as you look at internal controls, as you look at audit evidence, Disregard the people and look at the facts that are before you. I conclude by saying that people have a dark side. And when there's a compelling unshareable need, such as a drug habit or financial pressure, or they simply want to live beyond their means, they'll sometimes do things they shouldn't do. And so we as auditors need to keep that thought in the back of our mind as we do our work. So I hope that helps you. Take care and best of luck in your audit work. Bye now.